Hey, this is Doug. It's Backcountry Pilgrim back at you with another Getting Started Backpacking video. This time in part two, we are going to look at choosing your first backpack. Although we are looking at the backpacks first, because that's usually one of the first things that comes to mind when people think about backpacking, I do not recommend that you go out and buy your backpack first. Backpacking is a system. All of your gear needs to work together. It's not a good idea to just go buy things independently and then just hope that they will all work together. And this is especially true with your backpack. You don't want to go out and buy the right size backpack and then discover that your gear doesn't fit in it. Even if your backpack is not too small, it could be too big. It is possible to have too much space in your backpack, and while that's not nearly as big of a problem as having one that is too small, because the backpack is one of the big three, you don't want to mess this one up. Now, I have a lot of backpack review videos. Feel free to click through them and see what I have tested out in my time backpacking. But what I'm going to show you today are three different backpacks that illustrate some of the major differences between them so that you can at least get some idea of what you're looking for and more quickly narrow down the kind of pack you want to look at when you go out shopping. And by the end of this video, you will be well on your way to picking out a sweet backpack. Now, these are by no means the only important things, but they're important enough that you can very quickly use them to narrow down the kind of backpacks you want to actually try on and walk around the store in or purchase. Any packs that meet these four criteria will at least work for you and be comfortable even if they are not exactly the most perfect backpack you can possibly imagine. Alright, so let's get started with the first S in sweet, the backpack style. As you can see behind me, I have three very different backpacks. Now, the first thing you might notice is how different they are in size. We'll get to that in a minute. But the more interesting thing to talk about right now is that these are three completely different style backpacks. This over here is an external frame backpack. This is an old school style from like the 70s and 80s. If you grew up in that time and you were in Scouts or you were a backpacker back then, you probably recognize this. So what is actually doing the heavy lifting in an external frame pack is this large rectangle made of metal that attaches at the bottom to a hip belt so that all of the weight of everything that is hanging off the frame is driven into the hip belt and that allows you to carry the backpack's load with the strongest part of your body, namely your legs and your hips. So even though it's called a backpack, it is not actually your back that's supposed to be carrying the most weight. And even though there are shoulder straps, you don't want your shoulders doing that either. Now the nice thing about an external frame pack is that it is a really good load hauler. If you're carrying a lot of stuff, you can get very big packs like this and they carry really well for heavy loads, especially if you're just kind of moving across fairly flat terrain. They are also typically very inexpensive compared to some of the other kinds we're going to talk about. Really about the only downside is that they can be a bit heavy, but that is typical of any pack that is made to carry really heavy loads. Again, this is why thinking of backpacking gear as a system is so important. If you've got a lot of heavy gear that you're going to be going out backpacking with, you're going to need a pack that can handle that weight well. If you're already carrying a very heavy load, an extra pound or two isn't going to make that much of a difference if the backpack can handle your gear. If you decide that backpacking is for you and you want to start swapping out gear so that you can get down into the lighter weight or ultralight backpacking, your backpack will eventually have to catch up with that gear, and that's when a pound here or a pound there starts to become a bigger issue. Okay, sitting next to my external frame pack is an internal frame pack. This is more of the standard issue backpack that you're going to see at REI and other outfitters. You're going to see a lot of these on the trail. Osprey is a pretty popular brand, but there are lots of others. And essentially what they have done is they have kept the frame, but they've moved it to the inside of the pack. As you can see, if I move this around, it's not bending. There is a frame in this pack that is still driving the weight of the contents down into a hip belt. The difference is, instead of having a big rectangular metal frame, there's just a couple of aluminum pieces in here that help give the bag some shape, but don't provide the kind of support that a full frame would. 
Now the nice thing about the internal frame packs is that they can be worn a lot closer to your body, which keeps your center of gravity in better place and is better for climbing and rougher terrain. They can also be quite a bit more comfortable and they tend to be lighter for an equivalent amount of carry. Last, I'm gonna look here at a frameless backpack. So a pack like this has given up the frame completely. I can literally roll this into a ball. It is basically a backpack sack with straps added. It doesn't have much of a hip belt. The straps don't have super thick padding. And again, there is no frame in here. So you are basically relying on your packing ability to give a bag like this its shape. And you have the kinds of things that work well with a pack of this size and this style. Now, given that description, you may wonder why anybody would want to put up with a frameless pack, and the main reason is weight. Now, we'll get into weight considerations more when we talk about the next S, which is size, but for now, just know that by taking all of the metal out of a backpack, so there's no big rectangular frame and there's no aluminum stays, you considerably drop the weight of the pack. So as your gear starts to approach the ultralight, level where it's become very small and very lightweight, a pack like this is going to make a big difference to your overall base weight, which is the weight of all of your gear packed in your backpack, minus food and water and stuff like that. And so at that point, you're starting to count ounces rather than pounds, and taking the metal out of the backpack is obviously a good way to do that. Something of that size and with its stability is not going to do well with a bunch of bulky, heavy gear. One other consideration, and this typically doesn't really become an issue until you start getting into the ultralight, frameless type backpacks, but you also might want to look at the material that is being used. For example, the material on both of these packs is very heavy duty nylon. These packs are going to last a lifetime, probably more than one lifetime. These are the kinds of packs that you can roll down a hill, scrape up against rock, take through a bushwhacking adventure, and they're probably gonna come out in pretty good shape. However, when you get to the more ultralight type packs, you're getting into more thin ripstop nylon, maybe Dyneema or X-Pack or some of these other space age materials that are super lightweight and have good tensile strength, but don't necessarily last that long or do that well when it comes to abuse. All right, so once you have decided what style pack you're looking for, the next thing to consider is the size. Now, the size of the pack may seem like a pretty simple thing to discover, but there are a couple different things you need to know because it can actually get pretty confusing. First of all, typically when backpackers or outfitters talk about the size of a backpack, they are not talking about how big it is. Rather, what they are talking about is the torso size that can comfortably wear the pack. So the word size in the backpacking world is used more in the way a clothing or a shoe size would be used than to talk about total volume or carrying capacity. The issue is that for a backpack to fit properly, the hip belt needs to be a certain distance from the top of the shoulder straps to fit your body correctly. Now, many packs like this one are adjustable, and so as long as you get a pack that is somewhere in your range, you'll be able to dial it in just fine. For other packs like this one, it doesn't really matter what size you are because you're not going to be adjusting anything anyway, and if the hip belt doesn't land exactly right, it doesn't really matter that much because it's not really a weight-bearing hip belt. However, if you make the kind of mistake I did when I first got backpacking and you get one that is too large, the straps will actually shoot up over your shoulders instead of wrapping around them and that is going to make the backpack unstable and it's going to change the dynamics of the pack in a way that is not going to carry the load as well as it should. And basically your torso length is from where your hands sit on top of your hips, the top of your hip bones, to the big vertebra that sticks out when you lean your head forward. That length is your torso length, and that will correspond to the backpack's size. My recommendation absolutely is that if you are new to backpacking, go to REI, go to an outfitter, go somewhere where they really understand how packs are supposed to fit, 
and get fitted for a pack. But what about carrying capacity? That is typically referred to as a backpack's volume. Now, most backpack companies will include the volume of the backpack as a number in the name of the pack. So for example, this is the Jan Sport Carson 80. It is an 80 liter pack. This is the Osprey AG50. It's a 50 liter pack, and this is the Mountain Smith Zerk 40. It is a 40 liter pack. If the pack you're looking at has a number in the thousands, that is probably cubic inches. So you'll want to get some idea of how cubic inches relate to liters, and that way you'll know what you're looking at when you pick up a backpack. Now, here's the thing. Knowing the stated volume of a backpack does not necessarily indicate how much stuff you can get in it. Part of the reason for that is that there is currently no industry standard for calculating volume. Some companies calculate the total carrying capacity of the backpack, not just by looking at how much you can get in the main bag, but also any of the pockets, any of the stuff pockets. Other companies only tell you the main body of the pack, and they don't count the outside external storage toward the total pack volume. So for example, the difference between these two bags should only be 10 liters. If you remove the top pouch of this backpack, it actually becomes a 40 liter backpack, and yet these are nowhere near the same size. What that tells me is that Osprey is probably calculating volume off of just the bag, whereas Mountain Smith is including the outside stuff pockets, even though they are external to the bag itself. Neither one is right or wrong, but it is something you're gonna wanna consider once you get a pretty good idea of how big of a pack you want. All right, we are well on our way to getting a sweet backpack, so let's look at the third S. The third S is what I am calling storage, and essentially what that has to do with is how exactly are things stored in the pack. Some people are going to want a lot of organization, and for something like that, most external frame packs and many internal frame packs do a pretty good job. For example, my Atmos AG50 has a very large brain, or lid as they call it. This part opens up and even comes off if you don't want to use it. It's broken into a couple of different compartments. Inside the bag is a fairly big compartment, but it can get split into two-thirds and one-third by a separate compartment at the bottom and by attaching the optional divider inside the pack. It's also got outside pockets and a very large stuff pocket on the front, and it even has pockets on the hip belt. The Mountain Smith Zerk 40, on the other hand, is basically just a big bag. There is no internal organization whatsoever. However, on the outside are numerous pockets. You have your standard big front stuff pocket, two external pockets on either side, and several external pockets on the shoulder straps. So one thing you're going to want to decide as a backpacker is, how do you want to organize your stuff? Are you just going to kind of dump it all in a sack and roll it up and leave? Or would you rather have a place for everything and everything in its place? A lot of this has to do with experience. Once you've been backpacking for a while, you may discover that you don't really need a separate pocket for every single thing because it all kind of ends up in the main compartment anyway, and it's no big deal to you if you don't have those pockets. Now, you might be thinking, well, why wouldn't I want the pockets even if I don't use them? The answer goes back to size. The more pockets you have, the more material you have. The more zippers you have, the more straps you have, the more snaps you have. All of that is adding to the weight of the pack. This pack right here weighs more than twice as much as this one, even though it only carries 10 liters more in volume. Features cost you in weight. Everything you get costs you something. Everything you give away costs you something. You just have to decide what's important for you to keep and what do you not mind getting rid of? Another big factor in weight has to do with our fourth S in sweet backpack, and that is the suspension. If you were subscribed to the channel when I was trying to get ready to walk the Camino de Santiago, you know that I went through backpacks like there was no tomorrow. I was just getting back into backpacking, and I was trying to find something that would fit really well, that it would fit very comfortably, and that I thought I could wear for six, seven, eight, ten hours a day, walking around through Spain. And it wasn't until I discovered the anti-gravity system of the Atmos 50 that I finally found a backpack that I thought I could wear for many hours a day comfortably. Now, you can look at my review on this pack to find out how great it is, but suffice to say that it's massively cushioned. It's got webbing all the way around to the front of the belt. I mean, this thing is amazingly comfortable. However, 
The AG suspension system is very heavy. This is not going to be a good ultralight pack, but it's going to be great if you're carrying a bunch of heavy stuff anyway, and you want it to be well organized, and you want to be comfortable when it's on. If you've already got 10 or 15 pounds of gear, another pound or two really isn't going to make that much difference compared to how much different that pack would feel if you didn't have the kind of suspension you want. Compare the AG50 to the Zerk 40. Pretty thin shoulder straps and a hip belt that is basically nothing more than a nylon strap and a buckle. You put 20 or 30 pounds in this and you're going to be hurting by the end of the day, if not the middle of the day. So, when you go out to pick out your sweet backpack, the first thing I would look at is the backpack style. What style backpack do you think is going to work for you and for your equipment? That's going to quickly narrow it down to a certain kind of backpack. Then you're going to want to think about the size. Know your torso length so that you know what kind of pack will fit you, but then you also need to get some idea of how much gear needs to go in that pack. And this is why it's important to buy the backpack last. If you don't already have your other gear, you're not going to know how big the pack needs to be. One way you can kind of figure this out ahead of time is to get a box, measure it so that you know the cubic inches or the liters, and just start putting your gear in it. If it overflows, you need a bigger box. If it fits just fine, you know that you're somewhere in the neighborhood. Keeping in mind that if a backpack has a lot of storage organization options, not everything is going to fit everywhere, and just because the total carrying capacity of the pack might match the total volume of your gear, that doesn't mean the gear is going to fit exactly where you want it. And this is why to be ultimately confident about your backpack purchase, you really should just go ahead, bag up your gear, and bring it into the store. Plan on spending a few hours there. Try on a few backpacks with like sandbags in them. Good outfitters will usually have those around. And once you've decided on a couple of packs that definitely feel comfortable to carry, unload those sandbags and put your gear in them. And once you have discovered the storage situation and it works for the pack, you're going to know whether or not the suspension works because you've already tried it on. And that's the four S's of a sweet backpack. All right, I hope this video has helped you out. If it has, would you mind giving it a like? And if you are not subscribed to Backcountry Pilgrim, if that button down there under the video is bright red, you're not a subscriber, go ahead and click it. And if you want to know the next time a video comes out, make sure you also click that bell, select the word all, and that way YouTube will let you know when I put another video out. Until next time, I'm Doug. This is Backcountry Pilgrim. Thank you so much for watching.